going to be talking about chapter 31, section 2. It's all about women's struggle for equality. And, and really this follows a lot of the traditional tactics of the civil rights movement. Protests, marches, but also confronting social, like we've been talking about, those social barriers to equality, as well as real economic barriers uh, to inequality. So let's start with the workplace. Many of you guys mentioned that um, women are often shut out of jobs that are considered men's work. You know, I've, I've heard people say, never going to vote for a female president. You know, I've, I've heard religious leaders say, um, there should be no uh, female religious leaders. Uh, or even, uh, you know, that, that women should not be public figures. And, and some of that goes way back culturally. Um, you know, there, there's gender discrimination in traditional religion. You know, in Islam, women are made to wear the hijab in, in some cultures. That's a covering over their face. Um, you know, in, in uh, fundamentalist Christianity, uh, uh, women are often expected to wear a covering over their head when they attend religious services. That's because of a verse in the New Testament that says women should wear a covering on their head when they pray. Um, the, the word husband is an agricultural term for animal husbandry, as in the husband is the shepherd of the family. And, and, and again, there, there's just multiple you know, cultural expectations about the woman as a submissive figure, um, as, as someone said, as, as less than, and, and the, the husband, the male, is the, the guiding figure. Um, you know, it was even set up that way in American politics and history about how the man was the one who voted, who represented the family, um, who, who owned the property, who, who paid the bills, who, who made the money. Um, and, and so that, that culture changes very slowly. Um, but over time, you know, of course, more jobs have opened up to women. Ironically, it's often in times of war. Uh, when women do receive more opportunity. Uh, but often these jobs that are available to women pay very poorly. Um, you know, in the field of education, it is a field dominated by women. It pays more, uh, it pays less than uh, many jobs that are often dominated by men. Uh, you know, management in the private sector is a male dominated field. Technology, male dominated field. The science, Technology, engineering, mathematics, careers, male-dominated careers. Some of the most lucrative fields in this country are not excluded to women, but are dominated by men. You know, CEOs in this country are almost all men. And so, why is that? It's not that there is a rule against male CEOs or male management or uh, male uh, STEM career fields. It's just they're dominated by men. Um, you know, I went to an engineering school. The, the engineering part of campus was almost all male, almost entirely. There were very few females. I went to education classes. They were almost all female. And so President Kennedy studied this in the early 1960s. In fact, he appointed a presidential commission on the status of women and found two findings that are still true today. Number one, women are paid far less than men for the same job. Today it's about 80 cents on the dollar. 80 cents on the dollar for the same job. Now here's the thing, we have uh, uh, pay equity laws um, and, and those are enforced at the public sector. You know, for example, Ms. Pierce and I make the exact same amount of money because our salaries are public. You can look it up. It's not that exciting, but you can Google, okay, how many years, Mr. Whip, blah, 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 do all the numbers, boom. We make the same money. Why? Because by law, males and females have to make the same money. Yet, it doesn't happen because also by law, private companies may pay their employees 
whatever they choose. And most companies require their employees to agree not to talk about that. It's grounds for dismissal if you tell someone that you work with how much money you make. It's also culturally inappropriate to talk about money. And so as a result, companies are able to get away with paying someone less than someone sitting right next to them. And often in the private sector, salaries are negotiable. And again, this goes back to a cultural norm. Uh, studies have found that males tend to be more aggressive in salary negotiations than do females. Ergo, they wind up with more money. Secondly, women are seldom promoted to management positions. It's not that they can't be. It's just that if you do a study, which these have been done, about management positions in the private sector across our entire nation, those are male-dominated fields. I don't have, you know, I don't have a great answer for that. It's just that it doesn't happen. Okay, so how do you change these things? Well, in the civil rights movement, in the civil rights movement, women were often discriminated against. Even in the anti-war movements, men would discriminate against women. You know, in subtle ways like we've talked about. You know, I love the clip from Forrest Gump where they're at the Black Panthers and they're talking about the exploitation of African Americans in the war and the plight of minorities and then the man slaps the woman. And how everyone took the man's side, except for Forrest Gump, because he's awesome. Um, and, and so that's just, that's a problem. Um, and so how do you fix this? Well, number one, you've got to point out inequality when you see it. Since it is a social norm, that means it's up to each one of us to be aware of inequality when we see it. You know, that takes consciousness raising at a popular level. It takes time for these things to filter in. Because there is a pattern of sexism in our society. It manifests itself in very subtle ways that are embedded into the way that you were raised, that are embedded into the way that your friends behave. It comes down to how you dress versus how your male counterparts dress. It comes down to how you groom yourself. It comes down to dating and relationships. You know, sexism is pervasive in our society. So there are a number of publications about this. You know, obviously social media does a lot to raise awareness today. Uh, but in the 1960s, a popular book, and I have a copy if you want to borrow it, called The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan, uh, showed surveys and data um, questioning women about their satisfaction. They're just general happiness. And what she found was that many women were dissatisfied with the status quo, the way they were being treated or viewed. It was a national bestseller. Again, it's, it's still a popular book, and I've got a copy. And, and it helped to launch this movement of feminism. Feminism is simply a movement advocating for the economic, political, and social equality of men and women. That's all it is, is a movement advocating for equality of gender. And there are some national organizations that you can get involved with, like the National Organization for Women, NOW, founded in 1966, still a national organization advocating for the equality of women. Um, you know, many of these movements have resulted in laws, uh, but like Becky pointed out, that laws often still only represent the beginning of a movement to change a culture. Uh, but a couple of important laws. The Equal Employment Opportunity Act, which created the Equal Opportunity Commission, uh, designed as a watchdog agency to help women and to address injustice. But there's a couple basics. Okay, so if you have a kid, Obviously, it is the male and the female that produce the child. But in single family households, it's, it's very common to see 
the mother as the primary caregiver. It's very uncommon to see the father as the primary caregiver. That's still the case today. You know, with all our consciousness raising, with all our, um, you know, social media campaign, with all of our quality, still the norm today is a single family household has a full, has a mother as the family primary caregiver. And that's going to put a burden, an economic burden on that woman to provide for her family. How's she supposed to work? Um, so that's where uh, daycare centers, you know, we have the Western Carolina Community Action uh, daycare programs. We've got one here on campus. We've got one in Etowah. There's one in Hendersonville. They're everywhere. Um, they are federally subsidized daycare centers. And for many single family mothers, that is the only way they can maintain a job if they have kids. Um, and also more vigorous enforcement of existing laws. Well, guess what? Just like the SDS and the civil rights movement or the free speech movement and the anti-war movements, there are militant groups. There are women who are unwilling to patiently wait uh, for a day sometime in the distant future where they might be treated as equals. You know, there are some that are you know, that, that are unwilling to patiently wait for society to change. You know, for example, Gloria Steinem uh, founded the movement MS dot, you know, just to change a simple prefix. See, MRS dot uh, communicates that a woman is married. MS dot communicates that a woman is single. MR dot communicates that a man is a man. MR dot communicates that a man is a man. MR dot communicates that a man is married. MR dot communicates that a man is single. Why is there a difference? What does it mean? Well, I <laughs> uh, got, got a little word nerdery for you. So MS dot means um, mistress. Uh, you know, as in, as in belonging to um, someone else. And, and Mrs., again, it, it's, the, the prefix denotes the concept of ownership. And so Gloria Steinem just said, no, all women should use the prefix ms. Uh, for what it's worth. Okay, so legal and social gains. Um, these gender-based distinctions have to be questioned. You know, what about the use of a husband's last name? What, what's the meaning? What's, what's the history behind that? You know, where does that come from? But, you know, young ladies, you might feel pressure by society. Not, you know, your husband might say, whatever, that's fine. You know, when, when I got married, I was like, do you want to keep Owen? Do you want to use wit? I, I don't care. I don't want to fight about it. Um, and she chose to take my last name, but honestly, there's a lot of societal pressure for that. And so I never asked her about it, but she might have thought it's just simpler than trying to spend the rest of your life explaining, yes, my last name's Owen, but I'm married to a guy named Witt. You would have to answer that to everyone you meet for the rest of your life. Do you want to go through that? You can, by law, obviously you can, but you will still have to explain that for the rest of your life. Guess who, so my wife and I were married nine years before we had kids, guess who got asked about why we didn't have kids more? Do you think it was me? Nope, it was my wife. Why is that? I couldn't tell you, but she was the one getting asked that all the time. Okay, so there's plenty of these examples. Um, so how do you enforce this? Well, society, uh, you know, in terms of socially, you've, you've got to do that, unfortunately. No one else is going to do that for you. Uh, in terms of the law, yes, I mean, these large movements have resulted in things like the Higher Education Act, which bans um, gender discrimination in enrollment to universities. You know, there's Title IX, um, which 
requires that if a school has an athletics program, they have to have as many female spots in athletics programs as they do male. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, is, is there if you experience sexual discrimination in the workplace. Um, and also does, uh, and has now opened up uh, to tax breaks for child care, to uh, even federally subsidized child care on a needs-based um, setup. So um, the next one I want to talk about, I don't really want to get into a lot um, because of its controversial nature, but in 1979, uh, Roe versus Wade, the United States Supreme Court ruled uh, that a woman had the right to seek an abortion, to abort uh, and terminate a pregnancy if it's in the first trimester. And so uh, if you're curious about it, I, wanna, I don't want to get into the pros and cons, but you can, you can read um, the Chief Justice's majority opinion, uh, which gives their reasoning uh, based on the evidence that they reviewed, and you can read the court's minority opinion because it was a split ruling. Um, and, and you can read, you know, and I've, I've read both, and I encourage you to do so if you feel strongly about this subject, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and move on before I make you all angry. So, Okay, so um, meanwhile, the Equal Rights Amendment. In 1972, Congress passed the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, the purpose of this was to, by federal law, mandate equality by gender. And this actually resulted in a popular backlash, a movement to stop the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was ironically led by a woman named Phyllis Schlafly. Um, you know, she represented a number of religious movements like the pro-family movement, the, the moral majority, um, you know, kind of a lot of the evangelical coalition that, that came together to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and a couple of, I guess, their secular reasons, aside from the religious stuff, uh, is number one, uh, they felt that it would lead to the drafting of women, perhaps, uh, or the end of federal child support. Uh, but more commonly, it was due to social concerns. Well, that if we, by law, treat women the same as men, then that will undo all of these social norms. You know, and some of these go way back. You know, for example, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7 says, and I quote, If a, a woman is not to speak in public, if she has a question, let her ask her husband at home. I'm paraphrasing. I think it says a woman is to remain silent in the churches. Yeah, that's what it says. A woman is to remain silent in the churches. If she has a question, let her ask her husband at home. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7. Um, many more examples, as you can imagine, uh, on and on and on in, in the pervasive culture in our country. And so that's where a lot of this pro-family movement stuff comes from, called the New Right. And it really helped get Reagan elected in 1980. We'll talk about that later. Um, and so a lot of this focused on what people were calling the moral decay of our society. You know, while some called it civil rights and the sexual revolution and gender equality, some were calling the moral decay of our country. And so that's where you know, conservatives really gained momentum in 1980, focusing on these issues. So the Equal Rights Amendment was defeated. It only got 35 of the necessary 38 states for ratification by 1982, uh, meaning it was going to have to override a presidential veto um, because in 1982 Ronald Reagan was the president uh, who won election on that surge of, of moral conservatism. And um, so the, the movement, while it, it failed to get the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, um, it has raised awareness and led to changing roles uh, in relationships and marriage and family. Um, and, and it's also led to changing attitudes about career. Uh, you know, today we encourage all people to pursue the careers that they want, but to also carefully consider, you know, what sort of pressures have led them to choose that career. I mean, 
uh, you know, forming your identity is a very complex, a very fluid uh, element of your development, deciding who you want to be and who you think you are. And there are a lot of pressures, you know, there are lots of folks who want to decide that for you, you know, men and women. And, and so again, you know, these movements are about asking you to question that. Uh, because unfortunately, when it comes to education, when it comes to career opportunities today, there is still a glass ceiling. There's nothing stopping you from running a business and forming a corporation and becoming a CEO. There's nothing to stop you. But statistically, those fields are dominated by men. There's nothing to stop you from being um, someone in the career of science or technology. But again, those fields are statistically dominated by men. Uh, even in politics. So in 1983, women held only 13.5% of all elected state offices. In the House of Representatives, there were only 24 women in 1983. Those figures have gotten better, but they still have a long ways to go.